Congratulations, you've completed the core CSS mastery course. At this stage, you know all of the important skills for working with CSS as a web developer. Now, there are, of course, many other properties and values that we didn't cover explicitly in this course. However, you should have no problem learning those and implementing them into your CSS code, because after watching this course, you have a fundamental understanding of how CSS works. The rest is essentially just details. And to be honest, those extra details probably won't be used that much. Everything that we use at a high frequency on a day to day when writing CSS has been covered in this course. So before completing this course, I'm going to leave you with some final pieces of advice for getting started writing CSS. Perhaps you are planning to get a job in web development or you're just looking to boost your understanding of CSS for your existing projects. So tip number one, whatever project you're working on is to be consistent with the way that you write CSS. There's more than one system for styling a web page. For example, do we prefer to build out entire components in our style sheets or simply utilities that we can make use of? What type of naming convention do we use for our classes? Do we use classes at all or do we style specific elements? How much of our CSS is written in external style sheets? Is it all there or do we include some styling in internal style sheets? If we do, which styling do we include in the internal style sheets and which styling do we include in the external style sheets? Do we make use of inline styling at any point? Now there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to these questions, but the point is once we have a system or a paradigm in place that we're consistent with that throughout the project. If at any point we revisit the project, we want to make some tweaks or some customizations to the styling, we should know exactly where to find anything. We know how classes are named because we've used a specific naming convention for all of our classes and ideally related CSS styling will be grouped together, perhaps even in different files. The last thing we want is spaghetti CSS where we have some of our styling in external style sheets, some of it in internal style sheets, some inline. It's going to be very hard to keep track of our styling to make relevant changes that affect the entire application and keeping track of the cascade and the specificity of various selectors, it's going to be very difficult. So whatever we do, tip number one here is to be consistent. Tip number two is very much related. It's to think about the maintainability of our CSS. So a simple question we can ask, and it's great to ask this question before writing the CS code, because if we ask this question after writing the CSS, then there could be a large amount of refactoring necessary, which is what we're trying to avoid in the first place. So think about this question before you start writing your first line of CSS. If I wanted to change the theme, how easy would it be? And if we have to jump through a large amount of different style sheets and change the same value over and over again in order to change a theme, well, that's not very maintainable code. Another question might be, how easy is it to find specific types of styles? Let's say, for example, we wanted to change the styling on our fonts. So our H1s, H2s, H3s, paragraphs. Are they dotted around different style sheets? Because logically, that type of thing should probably be grouped together and maybe even grouped in an individual style sheet, which just deals with that type of styling, for example. The point is there should be organization so that if we want to customize a specific feature of the styling of our app, then all of the styling associated with that should ideally be found in a similar place. So that's either in a separate style sheet or it could just be one part of the style sheet. For example, all of the font styling is grouped together at the top of our style sheet. Then after that, we move on to buttons. And after that, we move on to tables. You get the idea so that if we want to style one of those things in the future, we know exactly where to go on our style sheet. During the course, we also saw the CSS feature of custom properties or variables. If there was a specific value that appeared time and time again in our app, for example, a certain color, and if we actually break down an app, thinking back to the color wheel we looked at earlier in the series, it's quite possible that an app just makes use of five or six different colors. And we will have many elements on our page making use of one of those six different colors. What if we were to extract those and set them as custom properties? 
And then anytime we refer to one of those colors in our styling, we use the CSS var function. So we are referring to that color by its variable. That way, if we have our color variables at the top of our style sheet, we can change the theme very quickly by simply changing the values of those color variables. Then every single CSS rule that makes use of one of those variables is automatically going to be updated throughout our entire style sheet. Tip number three is to avoid hacks. So let me be a bit more specific. Remember that during the course, we said that ideally we would avoid using the important directive. And that's because there's usually a better way to fix the problem. If an element's not styled how we think it should be, it's probably because there's an issue with the specificity or location in the cascade. So it's much better to address the root problem rather than simply using the important directive, fixing the issue with a type of hackish solution. So it's not the ideal solution and then moving on, just being content because things work. And that's just a very good general principle in CSS. Don't just be happy because something works. Be happy if you understand why something's working. So sometimes we can add some properties and values to an element and we kind of lose track of what we've styled, what's working, what's not working, especially if something doesn't work straight away and we try a few different values and properties, then when it finally works, okay, it's working, but we're not actually hundred percent sure which properties and values cause that element to appear where we want it to appear. And there's two different ways that we can kind of deal with that. Number one is we can just say, oh, well, it's working. It's appearing where I want it to. I don't know why it's appearing where I want it to, but who cares, right? It's working. That's the same kind of mentality we could have with that important directive, right? It's not the best fix, but who cares? It's working, right? That's what we mean by a hack. It means it gets something working, but not in the best possible way. So when something is working in CSS, but you're not 100% sure why it's working, don't be content with that. Figure out exactly why it's working, which properties and values you need, because in the future, number one, when you want to reproduce that specific aspect of the styling, you'll know exactly how to do it. You won't have to kind of hack your way around it until it works again. And number two, if you want to make modifications to that styling in the future, you're not gonna to have to worry about the fact that you might break something. You don't really know why it's working. So we're not sure which properties and values we can actually change without breaking the functionality of our styling. That's not what we want. So if we've managed to get something working probably more as a result of luck than skill, it's recommended fire up the dev tools, try and understand exactly why those elements are behaving the way they are. It's going to take you a little bit longer. It's tempting to just say, okay, it works and move on, but you're going to be a much better developer as a result. And this doesn't just apply to CSS, by the way, this applies to whichever other code you're writing, whether it's JavaScript, PHP, HTML, don't just be satisfied if it works, but you're not sure how, figure out how it works and you'll be a much stronger developer as a result. Tip number four is to design responsively. It can be very easy to forget this if you're fairly new at developing, is we design a site that looks absolutely fantastic on a very specific viewport. So for example, we have a 1080p monitor and we design a site which looks absolutely fantastic at 1080p. But what we don't realize is when a user connects to our site on their mobile phone, it looks terrible. In fact, they can't even read the content properly. The site's not usable. Or if another user with a 4K monitor connects, well, the site's usable, but everything's just kind of focused directly in the center of their screen. In other words, it looks like it's designed for a 1080p screen, so it doesn't look that great on a 4K monitor. Now, there's actually a whole range of different viewports, starting from very narrow viewports to very wide viewports. But I would say at the very least, we want to make sure that our site looks good on a viewport that's fairly similar to what we'd expect a user with a smartphone to be looking at. We definitely expect our site to be good on a 1080p resolution and we expect it to look good on a 4K monitor. So we want to make sure we at least have those three covered, mobile, regular screen, and 4K screen. But the truth is responsive design is not just for specific viewports. Everything in between, it should look good on as well. In other words, our page should change fluidly based on the viewport of the user. There isn't a viewport where a user shouldn't be able to enjoy the site we've created, unless of course they have some kind of very ridiculous viewport, which is not typical.
They had a viewport that was 10 pixels wide, which they probably wouldn't. They can't really use our site, but that's fine because no one really has a viewport like that. But we do know there's plenty of users with mobile phone who are browsing the web, and there's plenty of users with larger resolution monitors browsing the web as well. So you want to make sure it looks good on 99.9% .9 of the devices that are going to connect to our site. Of course, in order to do that, to generate a responsive design, we'll need to make use of CSS media queries. In other words, our styling should change. It should be dynamic based on the current size of the user's viewport. We also touched briefly on the concept of mobile first design, and it's not necessarily right or wrong to have mobile first design, but it is an approach that some developers take with their approach to styling, which is they make sure their site looks good on a small, narrow viewport screen, like a mobile phone first, and then they add media queries to make sure their content also looks good at wider viewports, like the 1080p screen and the 4K screen. Now you don't have to do things this way. You could design your site by default at 1080p and then add media queries for mobile viewport and for 4K viewport. That's fine as well. The reason for this particular principle of mobile first design is based around the fact that more and more users are accessing the web on mobile devices, such as smartphones and tablets. In fact, depending on which statistics you check, it's estimated that almost 70% of all web traffic is from a mobile device. And if you're wondering, phones are significantly more popular than tablets. So most of that 70% is phones and then a few percent of that 70% is tablets. So what that means is only around 30% of web traffic is actually from a desktop PC or a laptop. So if you just imagine that you have a website that works great on a desktop PC, but is unviewable on a mobile device, you've just isolated yourself from 70% of your potential traffic. Now, of course, we can argue that these statistics are not accurate. They're just rough statistics, but they'll be fairly close. And the key concept is that it's very important that our websites are functioning across a range of different viewports. And that's what we mean by responsive design. The final tip that I'll leave you with is to use documentation. Writing good code is not really a test of memorization. Sometimes it might seem that way if we're at a job interview, for example, and the interviewer wants to know how many properties and values we can remember, or whether we can remember the specific syntax for a certain type of function in whichever programming language we're writing. But the truth is, it's not important to memorize those things. The most important thing is to understand how a language works at its core. And that's why this series was entitled Core CSS Mastery. This was not about cramming your head full of all the different properties and values you need to memorize. It was about getting an intrinsic understanding of how the language works. If we know how the language works, then the rest is just syntax. But we can look up syntax in seconds. If we're writing code, we're probably at a desktop or a laptop anyway. We can simply search the documents for how a specific property and value works. So that really frees us up to broaden our understanding of a specific topic, rather than looking to drill down into a narrow area where our main focus is just memorizing a whole bunch of syntax. The syntax is there in the docs. Now, in terms of recommended documentation, there's two places that I'm going to recommend, but I'm sure there are plenty of other places with detailed documentation. The first is the MDN web docs. Now these have full documentation for any CSS property. They're fairly in depth. They're quite technical. They have the formal syntax for various CSS properties. Think about this as the full advanced version of the documentation. I wouldn't say it's especially beginner friendly, although they do have some very nice beginner tutorials there as well. But some of the documentation can be fairly complex if we don't know what we're looking at. So that's fine if we already have a basic understanding of a certain property and value, and we want to expand our knowledge of different values we can use for that property. But the best place to start, if you imagine, for example, there's a certain property, we've never heard of it before. We want to know what does it do on a really basic level without all of the extra technical fluff surrounding that particular property, then W3 is a great resource as well. If you want the zero frills basic explanation of what a property does and some of the basic most common values we can use with that property, check out the W3 docs. 
They might not have everything. They might not have the formal syntax with all of the available values, but they will give you the highest frequency values for a certain property and break it down in a really simple way. In other words, we've got two different versions of the docs here. We've got beginner docs, W3, great place to start. If you're looking for a bit more advanced knowledge on a certain property, then check out the MDN web docs because they'll cover pretty much everything. I personally wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to memorize code because what will happen, the most frequently used properties and values will eventually find their way into your brain naturally because you're just using them again and again. And the code that you don't really use very much, you won't remember it potentially, but then it doesn't matter if you don't remember it because you don't use it very much. And on the odd occasion, you do need to use a slightly less frequent property and value, then you could just run a quick Google for the MDN web docs or the W3 CSS docs. All right, congratulations once again. You're pretty much a fully fledged CSS developer. I'm also creating courses on HTML mastery, JavaScript mastery, and an introduction to programming. So feel free to check out those courses as well. Thanks very much for choosing this course, Core CSS Mastery, and I look forward to catching you in another course. Thanks very much for watching, guys.